Hello and welcome to Brightwood Christian Church. Thanks for worshiping with us. I'm Reverend Jana Quisenberry and we're so glad to have you with us today. Um, I hope that you sort of settle in for worship wherever you are, that even if you are still busy doing other things, that you just open your heart to what God might be telling you today and fully participate in worship as much as possible. In the um, call to worship we're about to share, you'll see a part for one and a part for all. And so I'll be doing the one and I'll join you in the all. And so let's get to it. Let's worship. God, you split rocks in the wilderness and gave your people abundant drink as from the deep. Come to us, Lord. Give us that abundant water. You made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Come to us, Lord. Send the waters down upon us. You turned the desert into pools of water, the parched land into springs of water. Come to us, Lord. Create springs in the parched desert of our hearts. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Come to us, Lord, and fill our longing. Let's sing together, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. I don't know that it's one that we sing a ton, but um, you'll recognize the tune, I think. And if you have a child say hymnal at home, it's number 709. And if not, that's perfectly fine because you're going to have the words on your screen. Glorious things to thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. God, whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for a blessed abode on the rock of ages founded what can shake the sure repose when salvation's was surrounded thou mayest smile at all thy foes see the streams of living waters springing from eternal love well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove who can faint while such a river ever flows thy thirst to swage grace which like a god the giver never fails from age to age Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear. For a glory and a covering, showing forth that God is near. Thus deriving from the banner, light by night and shade by day. Save the feet upon the manna, which God gives them when they pray. Will you enter into a spirit of prayer with me? All knowing and all caring God, we gather this day drained by another week. We're like a parched desert, empty and in need of replenishment. Visit us with your presence saturate us with your spirit and bathe us in your streams of living water that our lives might acknowledge and worship you to the praise and honor of jesus christ in whose name we pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to be singing Wade in the Water as we prepare to pray for God's people. It's 371 in the Chalice Hymnal. I'm just giving you a little warning about this. This is a spiritual. This is a traditional African-American spiritual, and it's beautiful, and I love it. And... Um, because of sort of how it's designed, 
it can kind of go a lot of different ways. And I, I had some fun listening to some different performances of this um, from choirs and jazz bands and soloists. And um, it seems like people do it very differently every time you hear it. And so uh, I'm just gonna sing it and just, you know, catch up with me when you can, if you don't know it well. And especially when you get to the, uh, the verses, um, it gets a little loosey goosey with rhythm. So if you're like listening to worship with a metronome, you just might want to turn that off <laughs> and just uh, worship God with me this way. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. See that host all dressed in white. God's gonna trouble the water. The leader looks like the Israelite. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. See that band all dressed in red. God's gonna trouble the water. Looks like the band that Moses led. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water. Look over yonder, what do I see? God's a gonna trouble the water. The Holy Ghost a coming on me. God's a gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. In the water, God's a gonna trouble the water. If you don't believe I've been redeemed, God's a gonna trouble the water. Just follow me down to Jordan Stream. God's a gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water. Will you enter into a spirit of prayer with me? And as you do, when you hear me say, oh, healing river, please respond. Pour down your waters and heal your people. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation, hear our prayers for all who thirst today. We pray for those who are spiritually thirsty, who long to know your presence but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who are alone and without hope, those who long to feel needed and loved, those who are searching for meaning and purpose. O oh, healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for all who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough water to drink or feed their animals or fields are parched, whose crops have withered, those who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive or who have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for those whose homes and villages are torn apart because of drought or famine. Oh, healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for an equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations, those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working to find clean water and make it available to those who need it. O oh, healing river, 
pour down your waters and heal your people. God, we ask that you would open our hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice, to stand alongside those who are thirsty, so that all people everywhere may live without want or fear and may discover the abundant life you promised to each one. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water, we pray. Amen. As we approach the table of the Lord today, I want you to imagine being in his sanctuary and the size serving that you get uh, of communion. Serving sizes are really strange here in the United States. Around the world, they're a little bit more normal size. Here, it's kind of Alice in Wonderland size. You ask for a small and it's like 32 ounces. I'm right now drinking out of a very large cup of coffee. Um, but when it comes to communion, <laughs> serving size is pretty small. Uh, if you're someplace that you typically are drinking from the chalice, uh, it may look like a big cup, but you only get a sip. Um, if you're someplace that has very small uh, cups that are individually sized, um, you notice that you're probably not going to quench your thirst with that cup. But I think it's a good reminder for us uh, that we, as we partake in communion, it doesn't matter what size cup we're using because um, the grace that flows through that could never be contained in any size vessel. The love that we share at the table could never be contained in any size vessel. And to try to do so would just be ridiculous. The love that we get from Jesus Christ is so large that it overflows anything that would try to contain it, even if we're lucky, us. And the representation of what we use in that space, bread and cup, whatever you're using today, um, is a good reminder that um, there's not anything in this world that can quench that thirst. Um, if you're trying to quench that thirst with anything worldly, um, then uh, you're, you're going to keep looking. You're going to always be longing. And so in the physical world, it sort of doesn't matter what size cup you drink from. If you're trying to, to quench the thirst of spirit with food of the flesh, with life here in this place, it's, it's not going to work. Um, but that little bitty cup, even though it's small, it can, it can quench the thirst of the soul. And so I invite you to spend some time with that today and to enter into prayer about what it is that you need to do to reach out um, to Jesus, to increase that relationship, to draw closer to him, that you might feel refreshed and renewed this week. All who believe in Jesus are invited to his table we're going to be um, singing our communion hymn today after we have our words of institution and prayers because um, this particular communion hymn is more of a meditation. And um, so it's appropriate to sort of pause and partake after we pray over the supper and then um, to meditate through this through this communion hymn. So you'll see those reversed today. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it and gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it and gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Will you pray with me? Holy God, thank you for this feast. Big or small in our own homes, lavishly decorated cups or plain and plastic. There's nothing that could contain who you are anyway. But we are grateful 
for the river of life that flows through this moment. We ask that you bless us, that our thirst for spirit may be quenched and that we might be revived and refreshed to go forward into your world this week to be springs of living water. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So our communion hymn for today is Eat This Bread, number 414. And this is a, a song that comes out of the Taze movement. Um, and that style of worship is repetitive um, singing of a song. We're only going to repeat this twice. If we were in a Taze style worship, it might be 15 or 16 times. But I just... I hope that you'll see this as a good meditation now that you have partaken in communion. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, Trust in me and you will not thirst. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, Trust in me and you will not thirst. Our scripture for today is John 4, 1 through 14. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the living water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. God is good. We, and all the time, we've been spending Lent reflecting on who Jesus says he is. And I know that today is Palm Sunday and we celebrate that. And when we were in worship in person, we waved our palms and that is all well and good. But I feel like probably since it comes up every year um, that <coughs> we're fine to talk about something else today in terms of centering our worship. But I, I do hope that you find a way to connect to palms today and, and to that um, glorious ride of Jesus into Jerusalem. But we're going to keep um, working on who Jesus says he is as we approach the cross this holy week. Uh, all of our other statements, Jesus has used a formula, I am. You know, I am the good shepherd, I am the gate for the sheep, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Today's scripture is not quite as simple, but Jesus is revealing himself to us in a special way, a way that, like the other statements, connects Jesus to who God is and what God has done in the Old Testament so that we can understand everything that's happening with Jesus as a fulfillment of the promise of God. 
And so today's scripture is the story of the woman at the well. It's a familiar enough story and we just heard it. So there's a lot more that we can flesh out of it. Um, but I don't think we have to rehash the story again. But since Jesus's claims of who he is in all these I am statements links to who God is in the Old Testament, I want to remind us of other sacred moments at the well. And so let's go all the way back to Genesis, uh, the first book of the Bible. Isaac has sent Jacob away to find a wife from his maternal grandfather's family. And, and you know, sometimes in, in the past, people have uh, made sure that, that marriages sort of stayed fairly close to the families um, to protect wealth or to keep hold of land. But this particular decision um, Isaac made to actually to try to keep close to God because the people that were living around Isaac uh, did not um, know and love God. And so he wanted to make sure that Jacob found a wife from the people of God. And so it's on this journey where he encounters and wrestles with God. And at the end of that journey, he finds a well and a shepherdess. And we can hear these words in, uh, in Genesis 29. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Now, when Jacob saw Rachel, <coughs> excuse me, the daughter of his mother's brother Laban and the sheep of his mother's brother Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of his mother's brother Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. He knew that his journey was at an end and he was grateful to have found where he was going after such an arduous journey. And he took the time to, to water the sheep with her. And later um, we see Moses and Moses who grew up in the house of Pharaoh, Moses who, who fled Pharaoh after killing an Egyptian when the Egyptian was hurting a Hebrew person. Uh, Moses runs away, runs to Midian, and you may have guessed he sits down by a well. And then Exodus 2 tells us the priests of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water the, their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and came to their defense and watered their flock. When they returned to their father rule, he said, how is it that you've come back so soon today? They said, an Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why did you leave the man? Invite him to break bread. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage. So in today's scripture, we see yet another man of God at a well with a woman. Jacob and Moses had showed extraordinary kindness to the women they found at their wells. But more importantly, through those encounters, God was fulfilling his promises. See, when Jacob meets Rachel, that's the beginning of, of a family of God that um, would be the, the 12 tribes of Israel. This is, this is the fulfillment in so many ways. This is the, the big beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abram that, um, that he would make of him a great nation. And that all starts right there at that well in their kindness to one another. And so God was fulfilling his promise at that well with Jacob to create a people. And then when we see Moses at the well, this is the beginning of his relationship, his deep relationship with his people for the first time, with being a Hebrew, with being in a relationship to God, um, having lived in the Pharaoh's house his whole life and been exposed to the gods of the, of the Egyptians. This is the moment when he's surrounded by people who love Yahweh God, and he would know that name later. And so in that encounter with, with Zipporah at the well, um, this is the beginning of Moses' um, journey to save God's people. So in those well moments, he is fulfilling his promise to create a people and to save a people. And in meeting the Samaritan woman, Jesus takes this a step further, taking that salvation beyond the chosen people of Israel. The Samaritans still exist, of course, about a thousand at last count. There's not many of them. And 
They consider themselves to be those who stayed in Israel during the Babylonian captivity um, when the most of the Jews um, were taken to Babylon um, and they feel like the Jewish religion was sort of poisoned by Babylonian influence then. And so they feel themselves to be the true religion of God and um, that the sacred space for them is, is a particular mountain, whereas sacred space for the Jewish tradition is the Temple Mount or at that time, the actual temple when it was still there in Jerusalem. So you can see there would be conflict. It's almost like sibling rivalry. You know, sometimes the closer you are, the, uh, the worse those conflicts can be. And so this Samaritan woman, just by the fact that she's a Samaritan, is an outsider. And you add to that the sinfulness of this woman that's so often the focus of our meditations on the scripture. Later uh, in their encounter, you find that, that she's had several husbands, a um, little more common today, but, but frowned upon at the time. And, um, and most people would have seen her as sort of the height of sinfulness. And um, when Jesus is at this well, um, then, then we have sort of a third encounter. We've had encounters at the well that fulfilled God's covenant to Israel by helping to create the nation of Israel and encounters at the well um, that would help to save the nation of Israel. And now Jesus by his encounter at this well, begins to break open the covenant that was made to Abraham so that it extends beyond the people of Israel and to the whole world. And not just the good people or the right people, but all the people. So keeping in mind the history at the well, let's listen again, beginning in verse 11, to see who Jesus is saying that he is today. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give becomes in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Now, I don't I know that doesn't sound like the I am statements that we've heard recently, but I think if we listen with the hearts of the first century Jews that would have heard this, we might just be able to pick up who Jesus is saying that he is. If we look back in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet of Jeremiah is testifying against God's people for turning to other gods. They've started to worship Baal. And so here are these words from Jeremiah chapter two, um, where Jeremiah is speaking on behalf of God. So this is kind of in God's voice that we hear this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, so when Jesus says the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, where do we get water? A fountain. Jesus is taking on the mantle of being the fountain of living water. Water so alive that once you have it, you too become a fountain. Just as once you take in the light of the world, you become the light of the world. Throughout the prophets, living water is linked to God's provision and God's justice. And Jesus as Messiah is the living promise of that provision to those who are in need, both of the salvation of the spirit and the day-to-day -day needs of the flesh. We hear in Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Zechariah 14, 8, on this day, on that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern Sea and half of them to the Western Sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. Isaiah 58, 11, as the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desires in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Isaiah 41, 
when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst i the lord will answer them i the god of israel will not forsake them i will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys i will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water and it's in this encounter with this outcast woman at the center at the well that jesus also proclaims himself messiah in verse 21 of the same chapter they're discussing the differences in their religion and jesus said to her woman believe me the hour is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem you worship what you don't know we worship what we know for salvation is from the jews but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeks such as these to worship him god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth the woman said to him i know that messiah is coming who's called christ and when he comes he will proclaim all things to us and jesus said to her i am he the one who is speaking to you in the gospel of john this is the first time that he admits to being the messiah in fact it's kind of the only time that he is the one that admits it out right although others say it for him instead if there's a takeaway from the scripture maybe it's that jesus chooses to reveal himself to the least likely person in a place that is so full of the echoes of god's promises fulfilled not only is god's promise fulfilled in jesus but is so full and overflowing that it reached past the borders of israel and the walls of righteousness to all the world Jesus shouldn't even be at that well. He certainly shouldn't be at that well alone with a woman. And he certainly shouldn't be at that well drinking from water that is Samaritan's water. And here he is not only drinking, but engaging and promising and giving himself and sharing who he is with her. And as we interact with the people around us, as the world becomes smaller every day, as we encounter more and more people who aren't like us, who make us uncomfortable, who frustrate us in their differences and beliefs, we can remember this moment when Christ reveals himself and offered himself to an outcast woman from Samaria. And we can use the kindness and the love that we've become as living water to, to share with the world to to overflow that grace to all that we meet the other thing that we should remember is to be careful that we're drinking from the fountain that we accept the offer of living water remember those words from jeremiah for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living water and dug out cisterns for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water if we find ourselves wanting thirsting for something we can't name even though by all rights we should be filled up we should be happy then we need to pay attention to where we're drawing our water there's nothing in this world that will satisfy no matter how much we think it will there's no point when chasing after the things of this world that we will get the deep commitment meaning and joy that we find in Jesus because the things of this world hold no water Let's sing together, Fill My Cup, Lord. It's number 351 in the Chalice Hymnal. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, Draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There millions in this world who are craving the pleasure earthly things afford but none can match the wondrous treasure that i find in jesus christ my lord fill my cup lord i lift it up lord Come and quench the thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up. 
my friend, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me Go now from the service of worship to the service of God's people near and far, refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers to you. Listen for the parched voices of the least of these. Search out the dry places and the arid souls and become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessings of the God of life, the Christ of love and the spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.